Good evening. And welcome to God's house on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. As we will see in our scripture and in our sermon, our theme tonight is put down what you love, pick up what you loathe. And this is part of a series of readings from the Gospel of St. Luke that illustrate the hard truths that Jesus sets before us for our edification, sometimes for our rebuke and correcting in righteousness, but ultimately for our salvation. And you'll see that tonight as well by the grace of God. We sing our opening hymn, Joyously I'll Praise My Savior. It's hymn 611, 611.
page 154, the service setting one. Page 154, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We turn the page to 156. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be to God on high.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O merciful Lord, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all. Grant us courage and strength to take up the cross and follow him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Through Moses, the Lord sets two paths before Israel, one leading to life, the other to death. Life is found in listening to God's voice. The fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy, chapter 30. See now today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and disaster. This is what I am commanding you today. Love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, and keep his commandments, his statutes, and his ordinances. Then you will live and increase in number, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are going to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not listen, and you are lured away, and you bow down to other gods and serve them, then I declare to you today that you will most certainly perish. You will not live a long life on the land that you are about to enter and possess by crossing over the Jordan. I call the heavens and the earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live by loving the Lord your God, by listening to his voice, and by clinging to him. Because that means life for you, and you will live a long life on your land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The case of the escaped slave Onesimus returning to his owner Philemon is an example of the cost of following Jesus. Paul urges Philemon to free Onesimus and embrace him as a brother. Philemon verses 8 through 21. Paul writes, for that reason, even though I have plenty of boldness in Christ to order you to do what is proper, I am appealing to you instead on the basis of love, just as I, Paul, am an old man and now am also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am appealing to you on the behalf of my child, Onesimus. He became his father while I was in chains. There was a time when he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him, who is my very heart, back to you. Welcome him. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might serve me in your place while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that your kindness would not be the result of compulsion, but of willingness. Perhaps this is why he was separated from, from you for a while, so that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a dear brother. Certainly, he certainly is dear to me, but he is even more of a dear brother to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, have written this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. Yes, brother, I am asking for a favor from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We turn to page 161 for the gospel acclamation. There's a short musical introduction with the Alleluia's to follow. Then we sing the seasonal verse, your words are my joy and my heart's delight, followed by the Alleluia's again. Please stand. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Your words are my joy and my heart's delight. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. Oh. 
Jesus teaches us that truly following him will come at a cost, the need to carry a cross, the need to give up everything. This is also our sermon text this evening, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 14. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. He turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, if he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, everyone who sees it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build, but was not able to finish. Or what king, as he goes out to confront another king in war, will not first sit down and consider if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. And if he is not able, he sends out a delegation and asks for terms of peace while his opponent is still far away. So then, any one of you who does not say farewell to all his own possessions cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how, it, how will it become salty again? It is not fit for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. The one who has ears to hear, let him hear the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated, we sing, Why Should Cross and Trial Grieve Me? Hymn 831, 831.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said just days before he died and rose from the dead, these words from John chapter 12. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it continues to be one kernel. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Anyone who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world will hold on to it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. John 12, 23 through 25. This fall, I'm going around and visiting with the families of our eighth graders. Any chance for a shepherd to go visit his flock is a great thing, and I'm looking forward to getting to know these students and their parents and families just a little bit better. These, of course, are going to be, God willing, our newest communicant members. And they'll take the first of, God willing, many more communions on the 7th of May, 2023. Between now and then, there's a lot of work to be done work that really began when they were born at home, at church, in their baptism, when God made them fully children of God, and will continue into the day God calls them home. But there is this special milestone, this special day coming, and it is a joy to be able to work with these young people and their parents, their families, their homes. And so at these visits, we talk about what the classwork is going to be like, what to expect, what I expect from the students and from the parents, and what is going on at home, the family devotions, the scripture reading, the singing, the prayer that is found in Christian homes by God's grace. And then on the 7th of May, God willing, unless he's returned before then, they will make their promises to the Lord to the effect that they will confess Christ even to the point of death. If you have already been confirmed, you've already made this very same promise, haven't you? That you will, no matter what the cost, follow Christ to the point of death and into everlasting life. This is your joyful confession of faith that you continue to make every time you're in God's house, every day as you confess God's word, as you hear God's word, as you say the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, you're confessing kind of a mini confirmation. Praise be to Christ. You are confirming the cost of following Jesus. Now, I read that portion from John chapter 12 because we're kind of used to that promise, right? That we will deny ourselves, that we will carry our crosses all the way till death. And we're, we're okay with that. We, we like that. I mean, we ask our young people to do that every year. And we, when we see that happen up in front of church and in churches around the country and around the world, that's a source of, of correct pride, not in those children or in us and in how well of job we brought them up, but in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of his word upon which we build all things, the rock upon which we are built So we like that. Yes, I will confess you, Jesus, until the very end, to the point of death, no matter what the cost. But it is kind of abstract. Because, as a matter of fact, it's very unlikely that these kids will need to die for Jesus. Or, in the unlikely event that that somehow would occur in their lifetime, we really... We don't really know what's going to happen if they would be confronted with that choice. And frankly, neither do we. So it's a bit, this confession of denying self, of uh, hating your own life, kind of intangible right now. Because of Jesus' complete sacrifice of himself on the cross, we are committed and we do believe in this promise that God gives us to make to confess him until death. We are committed to that all the way. 
We believe it, we trust in it all the way, but it still is a bit intangible. It's still a bit out there, right? So, Jesus, in the wisdom of his scriptures, finds lots of different ways to put this. And indeed, the way it hits us tonight in the gospel from St. Luke in chapter 14 really hits home because of how Jesus phrases self-denial. Again, in the abstract, we're okay with, and the one who hates his life in this world will hold on to it for eternal life. I mean, there's even unbelievers who would agree with us and say, yeah, amen, you can't take it with you. You come in with nothing and you go out with nothing. All right. I can get behind that. But then Jesus presents it to the large crowd that's following him in a way that is really uncomfortable, it's confusing, and it's downright offensive. Because he goes beyond personal. He goes beyond your life and he starts getting into your family. And he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, hate, and that is the correct word, hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life. Again, that part's okay with us. He cannot be my disciple. But the rest of it is kind of a, whoa. Now it's not so abstract. Now it's kind of tangible. These are people that you touch and you hug and you love. And I'm supposed to hate my dad, my mom? I thought Jesus says we're supposed to honor them, right? Well, these are the people that we want to honor and that therefore we'll have a long life on the earth. And we're supposed to, to respect them and, and obey them and love them. But Jesus says that we're supposed to hate our father and mother and all these other beloved loved ones as well. What is he trying to tell us? Because he obviously, and you know, he's trying to tell us something. And he's doing it in a way that is hard. I mean, we hear this, we heard it in the gospel, you were standing there and you go, amen. Praise be to you, O Christ. You are agreeing with the words of Jesus. And well, you should, and well, you do, because you are a Christian. You are a child of God, and you've been that way, most of you, for your whole lives, and many for a very long time. And if you're new to the faith, it's just as real and important for you, too. But this is hard. It's good and true, but it goes into our ears hard. So what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to understand this? What does this mean? Well, this is a perfect time to, to pull out one of the most important things that we as Christians who are scriptural Christians have, and that's that we let scripture interpret itself. And here we definitely need some help. This is hard. We need something that's clear to enlighten us. So, what is Jesus getting at here? What Jesus is teaching us in language that we can't miss and that we have to confront and we have to deal with it and that we need an explanation to, because when you talk, talk about hating my mama and my daddy, <laughs> I'm gonna need some explanation, preacher. I need some help, Jesus. Understand this, he's talking about the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. Those eighth graders and their parents and all of us learn and relearn again that we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Now, as long as it stays all things, it's kind of intangible. I love Jesus over everything. Right, but then we start unpacking that and start getting specific, then it starts getting a little hard. And then Jesus throws this in so that we can't not confront this because he loves us he loves you and he loves your mom and dad too jesus is telling us that this call to trust him above all things is painful and costly what will it cost you 
Could it cost you your family? Well, if you have an awesome family, and I think some of you really have wonderful, terrific families, families where you do everything together, you get together every chance you get, you love getting together, you actually like each other, you party together, you rent out pavilions together, you go to Packer games together, you watch the Packers together, you go to soccer tournaments together, you break bread together, you celebrate the holidays together. You like each other, you love each other. You have an awesome family. But then, as wonderful as that is, and that certainly is a gift of God, when overt sin, obvious sin, pushes into that awesome family, and there's so many ways that can happen, but the most obvious one is also the most common one. So when your brother is living in sin, and he shows up at Labor Day barbecue with her, the temptation for you is to wink, wink, and say nothing. That's hard. You don't want to have a confrontation when you're having a wonderful time. And you think maybe, well, I'll, we'll talk about it later. Keeping quiet has a habit, however, of becoming a habit. I'm sorry. Keeping quiet often has a habit. I'm mixing it up. Keeping quiet often becomes a habit. So that's the temptation if you have an awesome family. But what if you don't have a family, really? What if you have, God forbid, a terrible family, and those do exist? And you might kind of be a part of one of those. What's the temptation then? And there is a temptation. And the temptation is to think, oh, I already hate them. I already hate my mom and dad. They're terrible. They're deadbeats. I hate my children. We're estranged from each other. My brothers and sisters are the worst. After probate, it's just been downhill since then. And so I did it. I'm doing what Jesus said. Hooray, look at me. But of course, you're not. Jesus doesn't call on us to hold grudges and be angry at other people, especially our family. No matter how awful they are, he instead calls us to do what? Love your enemies. And again, your enemies are always going to be your worst ones anyway, the ones who are closest to you, or at least were the ones who are closest to you. And you're called by Jesus to love them, and that's hard too, to forgive them, to confess Christ to them to reconcile, if possible, with sometimes outwardly very terrible people, to be honest. And those people do exist. But Jesus still calls on us to do hard things. So assess where you are. Count the cost. See where you're standing. Awesome family, terrible family, some other kind of family, which is probably the rest of us, most of us. Where are you? Confirm the cost of following Jesus above even your loved ones or your hated ones and repent. The cost and pain of suffering that comes with following Jesus will find us sooner or later. And when it does find you, don't be surprised. Instead, be ready in the word of God, be repentant, and humbly follow Jesus into difficult and dangerous waters. Because there is no other place that is as fraught, maybe church life, than family life here on earth. Praise be to God when you have a good one. God help us when we don't. And let us be the voice of Christ in that dark situation. And let us always put Jesus first, because here's the thing. As we strive imperfectly, sometimes very badly, to follow Jesus and to put him above all things, God above all things, even mother and father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even your own self, 
When you put Jesus first, you are then able to truly love those people in your life the way they really deserve. And even, yes, to love yourself the way you deserve as well. When Jesus is your Savior and not anyone else, when Jesus is God and no one else, no matter how much you love them, no matter how much they've done for you, then you see clearly the way things really are. And that is a tremendous gift, never to be taken lightly, but to praise and rejoice and to fall down in worship before your holy God who loves you so very much. Dear friends, repent and humbly follow Jesus. Now, if Jesus hasn't returned by May 7th of next year, we'll gather together here in God's house and we'll confess together that we have loved ourselves more than Jesus, that we have loved our stuff more than Jesus. That's in the text. I didn't even talk about that next time. And that we have, well, loved our loved ones more than Jesus. And then what will we do? In faith and repentance, we'll receive Jesus' absolution as the forgiving lifeblood into our ears through the word of God and receive the Lord's Holy Supper for the forgiveness of our sins as we will tonight, all from the Savior who paid the cost of our salvation, which is tremendous. All of him for you. The cost of following him is great. The reward for us and for our children is that he gives to us the gift of life everlasting, which is far greater, far better. Dear friends, this is the cost. He has paid it. And let us now joyfully follow him. In Jesus' name, amen. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We turn to pages 162 to confess the Nicene Creed. Page 162. I invite you to please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayer of the church on page 164. In our special prayers of comfort, we pray for the family and loved ones of Dorothy Wallerman who died yesterday from a stroke. She was the aunt of our sister in Christ, Nancy Zimmerman. We also pray for the family of Oscar Pasalt, Pasalt, who died also yesterday, Wednesday, after many months of battling cancer. Oscar 
He's the father of Michelle Steinke and the grandfather of Gus Milkey. We also pray for our brother in Christ, Dean Kirkenstein, who is in the hospital and is near death at St. Agnes, and for his daughter, Melissa. Let us pray on page 164. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially our brother in Christ, Dean. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, especially our sister Dorothy, our brother Oscar. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. At this time, our rich and generous offerings are presented to the Lord. Turn to page 170, 170. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Our final hymn is printed on the back of your bulletin.
warm welcome to all of you here this evening. It's such a pleasure to have you in God's house. Members and visitors, please do come again. Have a blessed holiday weekend as well. Please grab your weekly announcements out of your mailbox and also grab a new copy of the monthly calendar. It's green this month for September, as it is September 1st. A couple of things to highlight. We are trying something for this fall to offer childcare for very little ones so that their parents might possibly be able to go to the adult Bible class in between services on Sunday morning uh, with a little bit less of their attention diverted. So if you had something that might be in your wheelhouse, uh, take a look at the information in the, the announcements. Also something that's a little different that I don't know if we've tried uh, recently, but I'm gonna lead just mostly a cappella singing. Sometimes we might have a pianist, maybe an organist, but generally just singing and we'll come for about 20, 25 minutes, and it's right before the Wednesday Bible class in the morning, and come into this beautiful sanctuary and sing hymns uh, and kind of just pick what we want and just go for it. So we'll try it this fall and see how it goes. The adult choir, speaking of music, is starting up again on that same day. This is both September 7th. The thing in the morning is at 9.30. The choir starts practicing at six o'clock. So if that's something you've never tried before, but you've always been curious about, we'd love to have you. And then, of course, Bible classes resume uh, a week from this coming Sunday on September 11th. And again, uh, adult Bible class is in the commons as normal. Uh, the Sunday school classes, pre-K through five, uh, grade five, uh, are in the uh, education wing. They always start in the music room. And then the teen Bible study will be meeting most likely, depending on size, but probably in the councilman's chambers, the conference room off to the right. And those are all occurring at the same time at approximately 9:10. Again, that starts the Sunday after this Labor Day weekend. Hope you can come to all of that and more. There's a lot more in here, so please take that home with you and check it out. Have a wonderful evening. God be with you, with you and your families, and enjoy each other's company and kind words in Christ this weekend. God bless you.